that's myself. Um, I'm Lorraine McCourse, said director of the Joint Secretariat, um, and myself and Paul will be leading out on the um, invitation for applications coming in, and then also the, on the assessment of those applications, and establishing um, contracts in terms of letters of offer uh, with successful applicants in terms of delivering out on those projects. So just um, you can put any questions forward to ourselves as we go through. So we're just going to give you that little bit of a policy, policy context, um, talk to you specifically about the um, outputs and results that are being sought within the programme, and I'll explain to you uh, why those are so important. And then, as I say, Paul's going to do the application process and also talk a little bit about what the expectations may be in terms of project management and delivery. So what you would need to be thinking about if you want to deliver out on one of these uh, Interreg 5A um, projects. Okay, well, just to begin with, um, and I say apologies for anybody who's heard this before, um, but it is very important and it's worthwhile just bearing it in mind uh, whenever you are coming together to think about potential projects under the Interreg 5A programme. This is a European uh, funded program, um, and with these new suite of programs that the European Commission have released, there is a shift uh, for the new programming period. In the past, we were able to identify key thematic areas. Um, so we'd have been able to identify, for example, environment, and we would have been able to open the doors and invite applications to come forward and effectively select out the application which we thought potentially was the best project, the most innovative, um, and something that maybe would have delivered what we hadn't already got within the environmental sector currently. That opportunity is still there, but what the Commission have done for these new programmes is that they have said that they want a narrow range of focus. They want to enhance the cross-border cooperation because these programmes are all about cross-border cooperation, um, trying to break down the impact of borders, and to really maximise cross-border value in terms of well, what is the benefit, what is the value of working collaboratively together across a border on a multi-jurisdiction basis beyond what could normally be achieved if you were to deliver a project out within your own jurisdiction. Now, the Commission found it quite difficult to um, secure budget for these new programmes, um, and one of the reasons for that was it's very difficult sometimes to articulate back the real and um, sort of long-term impact of some of the funding. And you'll see that we, when we identify some of the key themes that we want to invest in, you will see that there are similar themes perhaps than have been in previous programmes. That begs the question of, well, if we've already invested within that particular sector, why is there still an ongoing need? Why is there still a demand? and a long-term uh, requirement to invest subsequent amounts of finance within that particular sector. Is what we have done already not enough? So what we now have to do is be very clear in demonstrating what is the real demonstrable impact of what we are investing in and how does that actually make a material change out there on the ground which takes us forward into a new position compared to where we were in the past. So the Commission have asked us, and the programme that we have agreed with them, is that the programme must be more concentrated, it has to be very focused. The Commission have put a requirement, um, which we, you will see now on, on when I uh, speak a little bit further in terms of what we're aiming to um, deliver within these programmes. We have to demonstrate, and we have agreed with the Commission, a very clear and measurable output orientation. So there are specific things that we have indicated to the Commission that we will buy, in effect, with the financial package that's available and that we will ensure that it is delivered and maximised before the end of these programmes. For all of the new programmes right across Europe, there is a, an intervention logic which is focused in and around those results and outputs. And I'll explain to you what that means in a moment. But effectively what we're trying to say is we've got a high level overarching strategy. We want to demonstrate what the results are that we're going to deliver and we have now had to establish what the outputs are in terms of what we will actually invest the money in which will hopefully deliver on those results. And all of that then feeds back up into a reporting structure that we will report back to the European Commission in respect to how the programmes are being implemented, what we're funding, how those projects are progressing and ultimately what we achieve by the end. The key thing that we have to be very mindful of is that if we do not deliver and if we do not achieve the results and outputs, the Commission reserve the right to financially penalise the programmes. So there is the potential that a top slice could be taken off the overall allocation in terms of the financial package available to the Interreg 5A programme and that's obviously not a circumstance that we want to be um, getting into. We want to make sure that we maximise the value of that programme for the eligible region and we deliver out the entirety of what we've set out within that cooperation programme. 
So we do have an overall um, policy context within which we're fitting. Um, the Commission have established a cohesion policy. We have uh, a policy framework which stretches for 2014 to 2020. We're obviously trying to make sure that the programmes that we are now establishing make a direct contribution to the delivery of that strategic framework and deliver out on those policies. And that is also complementary to some of the other funded programmes which are being delivered out through other national bodies and um, right across the eligible region. We're not the only fund, but we have to make sure that what we're doing within this fund is complementary and not duplicating, is not conflicting with what's being financed in other places. And we've also then had to um, bring that European context down, look at it in re respect to what the national priorities are, and along with the member states in terms of the policy competent departments, establish a, a framework and a set of objectives which is complementary to the national priorities and will help to deliver on that European framework and make sure that whatever we're investing in, that it has a long-term impact. Now, in terms of the eligible area for the Interreg 5A programme, what you will see is that the eligible area has actually expanded for this programme. Um, it now includes the Western Isles of Scotland, and it also includes Greater Belfast, which would have been excluded in the past. So we have a slightly um, broader area that we can invest in, which is great. It means that we've got a, a good scope there in terms of areas where we can invest, and there's no sort of individual pockets which are excluded. We have a total investment package available to us of 240 million euros. And for the first time, that's actually larger than the Peace Programme, which is the other main programme that we um, deliver. Another main change that you will see in these funded programmes is that the intervention rate in terms of the maximum grant rate that the European Commission um, will allow us to offer has increased. So in the previous programme, that was 75%. In these new programmes, it's 85%. Now, that sounds fantastic. And it is great news because it means that we only have a requirement to find a 15% match funded um, complement to come in. But what it does mean, however, is that it just means that the overall um, package is not as large perhaps as it would have been before because we'd have been adding on 25% on top. So the overall impact that we can make out of the programmes, we just have to reflect we're only adding in the 15%, um, which is the mandatory requirement. And therefore, we need to be very careful and make sure that we are choosing wisely whenever we're choosing uh, the areas in which the, the investment is going to be made. Now, that match funding, uh, there are a combination of ways in which that can be made available. Obviously, um, cash contribution is one option, and that's very much um, welcomed. But there are other opportunities as well, and we can consider, for example, in-kind contribution. So that would bring in, um, for sake of uh, example, it would bring in the allocation of staff time. It could potentially bring in the allocation and use of facilities. It could bring in the use of equipment, which is already um, within the possession of a project partner. So if you are providing something into a funded project whereby you would otherwise have to go out and buy that particular element uh, in terms of that member of staff's time, that particular facility, that particular piece of equipment, if you were going to have to go and purchase that to allow that to be made available for the program, we could consider that as a contribution in kind. Now, what I would just caveat is that whenever we're looking at contribution in kind, we have to establish what a fair rate would be for that contribution. So we won't be able to allow you to just allocate and say, well, that would be worth X. We will have to understand that's fine. You may say, well, that would be worth X if I was going to have to go and secure that by other means. We will have to establish that that is a fair ma current market rate for that particular um, piece of um, contribution. So for example, if you're affording staff time, you'll need to demonstrate how much time that member staff is putting in, what grade they're working at in terms of what their salary contribution would be. Um, if it's facilities, you might be, for example, providing the use of office uh, facilities. If you were to go and secure that particular extent of office on the open market in terms of going to look for another provider, what would that square footage of space be worth? So we'll be trying to establish what a fair market rate would be, and then that can be a contribution to the project, and we will take that into account. Now, in terms of match funding, and Paul will probably elaborate on this a little bit further, we are looking at the potential um, within the previous programmes. The member states did make available match funding for the programmes. Um, we are looking at that again, and indications are is that the um, departments in Northern Ireland and Ireland may also be able to make some cash contribution by way of match funding available for these programmes as well. Um, Scotland has always brought its own match funding, and that will continue to be the case. But within Northern Ireland and Ireland, we are also trying to secure some additional budget provision for you 
in respect to the member states. Um, so you can put in an application and seek up to 100% of the value of the programme, but you will need to make that clear within your application. And I would just reference that if you can bring some money to the table, or you can make available some in-kind contribution, it does also help because it demonstrates value for money and that what's having to be provided by way of grant aid, that you're bringing something else to match fund that and that you are actually investing in it in terms of the project partners as well as what the commission are investing through ourselves and also then what the member states would be investing as well. So just bear that in mind, but you, can, you have the potential to be able to apply for up to the full value of the eligible cost of your project. Now, just again, bear in mind, eligible cost, you need to, and Paul will look at eligibility criteria later, and you can ask questions from Helen um, this afternoon. Bear in mind that not everything under these programs is always eligible. Um, you may need to, and I would always recommend for every project, always establish some small contingency fund um, to the side somewhere that if there are individual elements of cost which prove to be ineligible for reimbursement under the programme, that you're not left stuck uh, in regard to that and that you do have some other small complement of finance that will be able to match those costs should they arise. Um, but if you pay very particular attention to the eligibility criteria, hopefully those types of costs should be very small indeed. In terms of match funding, um, one thing that you just need to bear in mind is that there are um, state aid regulations. Um, this is a regulatory framework established by the European Commission. If you're not familiar with it, it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time to go and just do some very basic research and you will find reference to um, state aid rules and state aid regulations on our website. Um, state aid is basically where you are going to invest in anything whereby there would be a potential private sector interest, i.e. you would be potentially offering um, a degree of support, um, work, advice to a private sector organisation or interest or whereby you would be investing some money in a project where you might be, for example, enabled to um, secure an income in respect to that project. So if we're thinking in the, in the context of land, it might be, for example, if you were doing something in forestry and you were going to then, you know, be putting in place practices and maybe growing trees, which you could then seek the income. If there's anything whereby you're going to get a market value in terms of bringing income back into a project, we will need to look at state aid because state aid is trying to prevent us offering finance in a way which might distort the market and be anti-competitive. So we offered a grant to one particular project and that proved to be a financial disincentive for another private sector company that would be anti-competitive as far as the commission are concerned and there would be restrictions in what we could offer. So if state aid is applicable to these projects, we may need to take that into account and adjust the grant rate accordingly. However, there are a number of exemptions that the Commission offer, and if you are doing work which is primarily for nature conservation purposes, which is primarily for the benefit of the environment, then there are opportunities under the state aid regulations to say that that is compliant, and therefore we can continue to offer the maximum grant rate. I would not be too concerned about that for the purposes of today, but I just reference it so that you know that there are state aid regulations there. And if you're interested in pursuing a project, feel free to come back and speak to ourselves during the course of your um, project development phase um, and during the course of um, pulling together your application, and we'd be happy to guide you where we can. One of the other aspects to the programme is that we can, according to the regulations, we can spend up to 20% of the total programme budget outside the eligible area. We don't anticipate that we will be doing that. Um, we've never done it in the past, but the opportunity is there. But what we would be looking at is that if you, for example, propose to do work outside the eligible area, we'd be asking what is the benefit back into the eligible area. Now, it may be that there might be a research institute somewhere that's um, involved in cutting edge, edge research, which might be of a particular interest to your project idea, and that might be a, a very justifiable thing to engage in. So something like that may be possible, but this will be the exception rather than the rule, but just to let you know that the opportunity is there. The other key thing just in respect to these programmes is obviously that it is a transnational programme. You need to pull together a project application which involves at least two member states. So for the purposes of these programmes, that needs to make sure that you are engaging Northern Ireland and Ireland, Scotland and Ireland, or all three. Northern Ireland and Scotland will not count in terms of cross-border cooperation because it's within the scope of one member state. So that's the backdrop. Um, just to give you a sense of what's available within the programmes, this is the entirety of the programme. 
as we currently have it. You will see that there are a number of key strands. Um, so starting from left and going across um, to your right, we have the first priority, which is research and innovation. Um, and that's going to be looking at um, two components. One is high level, um, sort of third level uh, research activity with a sort of a business um, component to it. And that's specifically orientated, for example, in, in areas such as renewable energies and life sciences. We also then have a component within that particular aspect of the program looking at the research and innovation um, potential of small to medium sized companies. The next one across is the area that we're going to focus in on sp uh, specifically today, which is 72 million euros. And that you'll see there that that is the largest element and largest investment area for the program, which just goes to demonstrate the priority placed within the environmental sector by the Commission and by the Member States. And that's with the environment component, and I'm going to talk you through the three strands that we're going to look at today. But just also to make you aware that we have two remaining components of the programme. We've got sustainable transport with an investment um, opportunity there for 40 million euros. And there's a number of elements within that. We've got the potential for a multimodal transport hub, which has um, uh, already been advertised. We also have a, a strand of that which is going to look at the creation and establishment of um, green cycleways and also further investment in the electric vehicle infrastructure network across the eligible area as well. And then finally, we also have an area within the program which is going to be looking at health. So with 53 million euros um, to be invested in health and social care uh, services, and that's really about positive health promotion, prevention of ill health, and then looking at how we can provide access to healthcare services on a cross-border basis in a way in which benefits um, our citizens within the eligible area. So that's the overview of where we are within the programme. You can see that environment is an absolutely critical and core component of that programme, and we have a significant tranche of funding to offer out, and there we've, therefore we have a, an opportunity to make a very significant investment uh, within the environmental sector within the programmes, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to do that. So what I'd like to do then is just talk you through the three um, specific elements under uh, the environment sector and just let you see what is available. Um, what you may see quite quickly within that is you may look at that particular aspect of the programme and say, well, I had this great idea and it was really innovative and it was absolutely fantastic, but I don't see where it specifically fits within the results and outputs that you've established within these three specific elements within the programme. If that is the case, this particular programme may not be for you. Because as I've already outlined, we've got a results and output focus, which we have to deliver for the Commission to satisfy our requirements in terms of the delivery of these programmes. And we must ensure that we've invested the money to secure those results and outputs in the first instance. So if your project does not fit within these and does not actively help to deliver out on those results and outputs, it may not be the programme for you. Um, we do have other programmes, and you'll see information within your pack in terms of transnational. You may under see that there's maybe some more scope within that, and if that's the case, we'd be very happy to put you in contact uh, with another colleague of ours within the Belfast office, um, Declan McGarrigal. But we're hoping that you will see plenty of opportunity within these three strands in terms of what you might be able to apply for and deliver out within respect to the environment under the particular, this particular program. So just to take you through, first of all, the habitats and priority uh, species objective. Within this, we've got 11 million um, ERDF, or that's the European Commission's financial package to devote to this particular strand. By the time we add on the 15% additional match funding, obviously the overall financial uh, package is slightly higher again. We are looking to deliver out the entirety of that particular strand. Um, we don't have a specific breakdown in terms of the individual elements out of this, but we have an overall financial package and therefore we've got scope now in terms of flexibility to look at the project proposals that come in to us and determine which of those project proposals can utilise that finance in the most cost effective way to deliver a high quality project and get results delivered out there on the ground. Within the habitats area, we have this intervention logic. So this is what I referenced earlier. And this is the way it's set out within the cooperation program. So what we've first of all got is we've got an overall thematic objective, and it's thematic objective 2.1, which is really looking at the recovery of protected habitats and priority species. So that's our high level overarching kind of priority in terms of what we aim to deliver. 
What we then had to do with the Commission is to establish a result indicator, which is, okay, we want to do this in terms of that thematic objective. How would we know whether or not we have actually delivered? And what has been established is a result indicator, which is, in effect, what we as an organisation are going to have to respond back to the European, European Commission on to demonstrate whether or not we are delivering, how far we get in respect to the recovery of these protected habitats and priority species, and the result indicator that has been established is that we will increase the percentage of selected protected habitats in or approaching favourable condition. There's a baseline which has been established and we have a target then to achieve by 2023. So when we're looking at your project applications coming in, what we're constantly going to have on the back of our mind is, will this particular project proposal help us to deliver against that result indicator? Will it take us forwards in terms of allowing us to increase the percentage of those habitats that which are in favourable condition. And then what we have is we have an output indicator. And this is what we're asking the projects to look at and your proposals to look at in terms of we will be asking the projects to deliver against the output indicators. So for this particular strand, the output indicators here are 4,500 hectares of habitat supported in order to attain better conservation status and the delivery of 25 conservation action plans. So those are the specific outputs that we will be focusing in on, and what we're going to be looking at whenever the project proposals are being assessed is, does this project proposal deliver out on a number of hectares whereby it's going to make a real and demonstrable change to the condition of those protected habitats from the time at which we invest the money to the time at which we conclude on that funded project? Bearing in mind that the European funding programmes, they are short-term finance, they are project-related, and I don't, that doesn't particularly fit sometimes within the environmental sector because some of your results and outputs can take quite a period of time to deliver and achieve, but we only have a finite window here, and it is project finance. It's not ongoing, long-running <coughs> core finance. We have to define a start. We have to know what the delivery package is going to be in terms of what's going to be implemented during the course of the project, and we then have to be able to wrap it up at the end and say, did we achieve and deliver out on that result and output by the end? So those are the outputs that are defined within the programme, and that's what we are now tasked with the responsibility of trying to make sure we deliver on behalf of the Commission and then any other match funders that come forward, in particular from the Member States. So that's your um, result indicator. So I said that's the one that we will report back to the Commission on. Your proposals will specifically relate to the output indicators, but we want to understand what difference will that project proposal make to the, the establishment and the achievement of this result indicator. So within the programme as well, there are a number of defined indicative actions. They are just that. They are indicative. They are not an exhaustive list. They do not have to form the entirety of your project proposal. Um, you may come up with different ideas. That would be wonderful if you do. But these are the indicative actions that have been um, established within the programme, whereby we think if some of these um, particular actions happened, that would help us to deliver out on those results and outputs. So, for example, we've got the development of habitat mapping of protected habitats and, and sites of cross-border relevance. Now, we've had a lot of very useful information that has already been provided and you will see available on our website in respect to... Um, the member states providing us with information on where some of these um, protected habitats are located um, and they've given maps and so on which are already available on our website and there's further detail available from the departments. So if you're looking for areas in which would be already identified as priorities for action, the list is already there which takes a huge degree of your work out of the equation in terms of trying to come up with a suitable proposal. So that's already there but obviously there's ongoing work in terms of expanding perhaps on some of that information that's available. That, in terms of maps, that's only ever a snapshot in time. That information needs to be kept current. It needs to be kept up to date. So that's one potential action which could be financed under the programmes. We also then have, for example, the development and implementation of these conservation action plans. It's all very well to know where some of these habitats and um, species may be located. But if we don't do anything positive to try and establish a framework in terms of what would be a useful and appropriate way to manage and protect them, then we're not going to get very far. And we're looking then at how we can provide that better framework in terms of a, a real understanding of what are the key risks, what are the key challenges for those particular areas, what are appropriate conservation and management techniques which would help to protect them in the long term, what are the land management um, criteria that we should be putting in place with 
private sector landowners, public sector landowners, to make sure that in the long term these areas are uh, protected and going to survive. Now, many people will say, well, what is a conservation action plan? What is enough? How broad should that be? How focused should that be? Um, and we will be looking and trying to establish over the next um, short period with the Member States a guidance note and a guidance document for you in terms of what our understanding would be as a, a minimum requirement in terms of conservation action plan so that you'll be able to use that to inform your detailed submissions at a later stage uh, and the delivery of your, of your project. However, it will simply be just a guide. So we will try and make that available for you, but that does not limit you and it does not restrict you. You may want to modify, adapt, add to that to make it appropriate for your individual project proposal, and that's absolutely fine. It will only be there as a guide. So we're also looking at the delivery of tangible conservation action. Um, there's no point in having lots of plans and documents sitting on shelves if you don't do anything with them. And we're looking at what management um, activities and protection activities can actually be delivered to encourage and sustain the regeneration of those habitats and the protection of those species. You may also want to look at the um, development sharing of best practice and enhancement of skills in management uh, techniques. There may also be a need to um, enhance and to further develop the um, information data set which is available and make that available in a, a wide and publicly accessible way. You may want to consider the removal of invasive species in some of these areas. We may also be able to finance the research into habitats and species in terms of looking and trialling different techniques in different places to see what has the uh, most optimum impact. And also looking at what the impact is of climate change and the fact that we are not in a static environment. It is continuing to change. It is continuing to be um, modified and altered as a result of um, climate patterns. And what do we need to do um, at member states and at a European level to adapt and to accommodate that and protect our priority areas. And there's also the opportunity to um, continue and to further develop the education and outreach activities which many of you would be engaged in at this point already. So that's the kind of areas that are available under Habitats and Biodiversity. Now within your information pack there is a copy of the citizen summary there. You will see that there are a range of habitats and species which have been identified within the cooperation programme and they're outlined within that citizen summary document. Those are our priority for action. Um, it is an exhaustive list. Um, so those are the um, habitats and species that have been identified and agreed with the Commission. If your particular um, habitat or your particular species of interest is not there on that list, I'm sorry. Um, that is the list that we will be working towards. What you will notice, however, is that there is a slight um, discrepancy in that we have an output which is specifically um, orientated towards habitats. You don't have a similar output in respect to species. We are still able to look at projects which are specifically orientated towards species, and we are still welcoming those, but it's also worthwhile whenever you're looking at that, referencing whether or not there are specific habitats which are relevant to those species as well. But the habitats and biodiversity strand, you will see that it is quite specific this time. We are looking to concentrate the investment in areas where we're going to have an impact and we'll be able to demonstrate that we've been able to achieve something by the end of the programme period. So just moving on then, the next strand under the um, environment theme, just to reference, and these are broken down within the cooperation programme, perhaps in a way that doesn't seem logical from a, an environmental perspective, because you know that all of these systems are interlinked, they are dependent on each other, but it's just the way the European um, funding streams work. We have to identify specific budgetary provision um, for each of the different elements. So the next one, which is uh, within the cooperation programme there and specifically set out, is the marine. So again, we've got 11 million um, euros from the European Commission's um, programme um, to invest in this area. Similarly, 15% match funding. We're looking again in terms of the match funding, what can be made available by member states. Um, and again, state aid. We don't really envisage that state aid is going to have a significant um, impact on this particular aspect of the programme, but obviously we will look at project proposals whenever they come our way. So just looking again at that intervention logic in terms of the marine, and just breaking that down um, as it's set out within the programme, you will see that this particular strand, and I think it's just reflecting where we are in terms of our understanding of the marine environment and some of the work which is ongoing within the marine, 
It's not just quite as specific as it is for the habitats and biodiversity strand. So what we have here is we really are looking at uh, an overall objective of really trying to enhance our management of the marine protected areas and species. And what you'll see in terms of the results indicator is it's very, um, it's, it's slightly more um, strategic in that what we're looking really at here, it's not so much in terms of the individual kind of specific areas, it's more looking about how we collaborate on a cross-border basis and how we can work better together to make sure that we are effectively managing, understanding and trying to protect our marine environment in the longer term. So what we have at the moment is we really are just reflecting within the programme that there's not maybe a huge amount of collaboration and joint management ongoing at this point. It tends to be more within individual member states for very understandable reasons. And what we're looking to try and do is trying to find a mechanism through the investment within this programme to start that whole concept of joint um, cross-border management to try and establish a better framework, a better network of activity that's ongoing in that area to try and enhance that degree of collaboration. So when you're putting forward a, a project proposal in this, while you will see that we have got outputs identified, the key thing that you need to do in terms of project proposals under the Marine is make sure that you are specifically telling us about what that means and what that actively delivers in terms of enhanced collaboration, enhanced cross-border working, enhanced management capability on a cross-border basis in respect to the marine environment, because that's, in effect, what we're responding back to the Commission on. But obviously, we do have a range of output indicators within this particular strand, which, if we deliver out on this, it will actively help us to increase the degree of collaboration, which is happening on a cross-border basis. So what we have here are the output indicators. And what we've got, I'll just scroll on, and I've got them slightly bigger for you here, you'll be able to see it better. The first one is we have an output indicator here for a network of buoys, really to allow us to get better real-time information uh, and telemetry systems in place whereby we can understand what is happening to our, our marine environment in a, a better way. And within the program, you'll see that there are three particular areas. Now, it's not prescriptive in terms of how many buoys. It's not prescriptive in terms of what constitutes a network. But what is defined within the program is that we would expect and hope that it would at least deliver an enhanced information in respect to the three areas here, which are seals, cetaceans, and salmonids. So in terms of species uh, monitoring, we've got that within the program. Um, but it's not any more prescriptive than that. We're also looking at the establishment of models of conservation. So what are we doing and how are we um, helping to conserve and protect the uh, marine environment? And six marine management plans for designated areas. We also have in here as an output the um, installation of a system for prediction of bathing water quality so that we can get better real-time information in terms of what's happening in terms of the um, flow down from our freshwater environment into our transitional waters and marine environment and understand whether or not we are in a good bathing water um, sort of status or whether or not that has been impacted as a result of other factors. So those are the output indicators where the, that are established within the marine, but again, just bearing in mind that we are looking at how we work collaboratively on a cross-border basis in respect to marine environment and make sure that we are trying to find ways in which we're managing it better and that we understand the competing interests in terms of what might be private sector, business type interest, energy interest and so on, and what that means in respect to the protection of the marine environment. So the kinds of actions that are identified within the program under this strand are, for example, the um, implementation and development of management plans, which are cross-border management plans, mapping of the marine seabed environment, and we've already done some very um, good work in that regard under the previous program, projects like Ennis Hydro, where we've done some seabed mapping there, but there's obviously much more to do, and we don't really understand a lot about, about our uh, marine seabed in some areas. Looking at the um, creation of a network of marine protected areas in terms of well, what are the special areas that we need to be trying to um, protect in the longer term on a cross-border basis. How we can um, understand, again, the impact of climate change on the marine environment and do some research and development work in that area. Again, looking at the potential for marine skills initiatives. Possibly research programs which are coordinated and um, delivered on a cross-border basis. Knowledge and data sharing. And then, as we mentioned earlier, the um, prediction model development and signage for short-term pollution and management of bathing water quality, um, so we can understand better what's happening in a marine environment on a real-time basis. 
So the final area then just to reflect on is in respect to the freshwater uh, environment. Now, this is the larger area in terms of investment within the program. We have 20 million euros available under the Interreg 5A program for this strand, which means that we've got a, a total pot available in terms of budget of um, just in excess of 23 million euros now. Again, similarly, we're looking at the potential for match finance for the member states. Um, and again, we will look at whether or not there are state aid uh, implications as a result of doing some work in this area. So in terms of the intervention logic, what we have here is we have got a high level thematic objective to improve fresh water quality in cross-border river basins. Again, we are getting very good information coming through from our departmental colleagues, and we are expecting some additional information to be available for this particular strand of the program within the next couple of weeks in respect to freshwater um, river basins. That will be made available on our website, and just keep an eye out for that, which hopefully will help you to refine your proposals. Um, and that will come forward from um, Northern Ireland Environment Agency very shortly, which is a great um, step forward in terms of anybody who wishes to um, develop project proposals in this area. What we are again looking at in terms of result indicator is we are trying to establish and demonstrate to the Commission that we are making a demonstrable difference, that we are making a change. So what we're looking at in a result indicator here is to increase the percentage of cross-border and fresh water bodies um, with uh, cross-border river basins that have good or high quality. Now we've got a current baseline there of 32% and we have a target of 65%. This is the result that we will be articulating back to the Commission. Now any of you that work within this area will immediately say, but fresh water and um, river basin, uh, river quality will be impacted by so many factors. Um, you know, we can do things that are of immense benefit. We can try and deliver demonstrable change. But if there is a pollution incident um, as a result of a private sector business somewhere within this river basin, that can have a, a catastrophic impact in a very short term way, which could undo everything that we've just done in terms of the positive work. We know that, we understand that, um, but we have had to ident identify a result indicator for the Commission. What we'd be encouraging you to do is if you're developing proposals within this area, is obviously define what you're trying to deliver, how you consider that that will make an impact and a change, and tell us what the assumptions are that you are putting, you know, that you're putting in place in and around those activities and outputs, which is we believe that if the status was, in terms of the, the context within which we're working, was X, Y, and Z, we would be able to make this degree of change. That then, if there's some degree of um, impact from an external source that you were not in a position to be able to control, we can go back and articulate back to the Commission and go, these actions did deliver that change. However, there was an impact which came in from an external source which knocked it back and had a negative impact, and the reason is because. So that's the way we will approach it. We do know that there are external factors there, but what we'll be looking at is within those proposals, what are you proposing to do which will give you the maximum potential to be able to make a difference? So the kinds of outputs that we have within this particular strand, that's your result indicator there. The outputs that we have is that we have an output to deliver three river quality improvement projects within the particular um, uh, delivery period of the program. We also have an output here to establish 50 cross-border ground monitor, uh, groundwater monitoring wells. And we also have an output to deliver one cross-border drinking water sustainable catchment area management plan. So by the end of the investment of the 20 million of the European Commission's finance in this area, that is what we need to demonstrate that we have delivered by the end of that programme. So the kinds of actions that could come in place in and around this is obviously looking at the development and implementation of management plans. We're obviously trying to make sure that whatever is being delivered is um, going to be uh, complementary to and helping to deliver out on the Water Framework Directive. We are looking at delivering activities which will directly improve um, river uh, water quality. We are also looking at the opportunity to um, further fresh water quality management research. So what is it that we do not know now that we would need to know and understand if we're really to have a long-term impact in this area? And then we're hoping that the establishment of that network of groundwater monitoring wells will also help to deliver out in a very tangible way to provide additional data sets, which are real-time data sets, to come back in and to su uh, supplement the information that we know in respect to some of that fresh water quality and have a better understanding of what impacts on that um, and where we are at any particular point in time. 
So that's just the overview in terms of the indicative actions. As I said, those are indicative. They do not have to be the exhaustive list in terms of what you aim to deliver. But if you're incorporating in some of those particular concepts and ideas, then you'll be automatically demonstrating that you are delivering out in a way which is complementary to the programme. So who can apply? Well, in effect, anybody can apply. Um, we've referenced the issue in terms of state aid. Um, if we have private sector partners engaged in a project or if you're looking to invest, and offer support to a private sector company, then we will need to look at that carefully, but there are ways and means in which we can deliver that. But pretty much anyone can apply. What we would say, however, is we are looking for a lead partner, and Paul will talk to you about that later. We will be looking to establish a letter of offer or a contract with a core organization which can demonstrate their delivery um, capability within this particular project proposal and that they have the capacity to make sure that it is delivered out in terms of financed and also implemented and pull all of the other project partners together where there are project partners. We are looking for cross-border partnership. So as I said earlier, you must have a partnership which is representative of at least two member states. That partnership needs to have established a very good and clear governance and partnership arrangement in terms of how you're going to work together. And again, Paul will talk to you a little bit more about that later on. You have to demonstrate why your project idea is appropriate in terms of a cross-border program. What is the benefit in Interreg 5A investing in you, bearing in mind that Interreg 5A is about cross-border collaboration, about breaking down the impact of borders. Why is this, in terms of your project proposal, why is it beneficial to do that on a cross-border basis as opposed to single jurisdiction projects? So we'll not be looking for projects whereby you've just got one partner in each jurisdiction doing their own thing, merrily working away and telling each other once a year how they've got on. That will not suffice. It has to be real, tangible, meaningful cross-border cooperation and collaboration on the implementation of your project. And what we'll be looking, there's a four-part test in terms of cross-border partnership. You have to demonstrate that you're doing, you've developed it on a cross-border basis, so that you've come together to work up the proposal, that it's going to be implemented on a cross-border basis, and that either it's going to be jointly financed or jointly staffed, but I would recommend that out of those four parts, if you can deliver all four, that adds amazing strength to your project proposal. So the last two are either or, but I would strongly recommend that you make them ands. So that's cross-border development, cross-border implementation, cross-border financing, and or cross-border staffing. So I mentioned the lead partner. The lead partner will take the responsibility for ensuring the project gets delivered out that organisation will accept the contract from ourselves and then we'll establish a partnership agreement with any other project partners and hold everybody else to account in the delivery of the project. And then you will have a range of other potential um, organisations, interests perhaps, who you will maybe be working with, who will be recipients or beneficiaries of what you're doing. Some of those may be partners, some of them may be not. Um, that's really a matter for you to consider in terms of the, the structure of your project as you move forward. So what should your project do? Your project, in effect, should complement the other European-funded programmes and demonstrate that you are helping to deliver out on what we're seeking to do under the programme in terms of helping the Commission to deliver out on its cohesion policy. It should fit with national priorities, so if you're reflecting on what the um, Member States have articulated in terms of their priorities, that will be a great demonstration of your um, policy context. You should be, as I said, looking at the joint impact in terms of collaboration impact of working on your project. You should have a committed partnership. You need to look and make sure you've got the right organisations with the right skills, the right capacity coming forward to help deliver out on the project. So we will be looking and saying, well, look, are the right people around the table here? Have you got the right skill mix to be able to deliver this project out? And make sure that you deliver out on the results and outputs that are identified. We'll obviously be looking at what your results and outputs are. So what have you said that you will deliver within your application? And it needs to be tangible. It needs to be measurable. So bear in mind that whatever you put there is an aspiration. You need to know how you're starting in terms of what your baseline is, what you're going to be doing, and how you're going to track the change through the course of the project and ultimately measure the overall impact at the end and respond back to ourselves in that regard. You need to have a clear plan for delivery. So you need to have a plan in place and a structure in place as to how you're going to go about this. And you need to be, have a clear structure as to how you're going to work together to make sure that that's delivered. 
you don't want to leave yourself in a position where everybody goes off to do their own thing and you don't find out until it's too late in the day that one particular partner's had a difficulty, they haven't been able to deliver everything and that that materially impacts on your overall delivery of the project. And obviously we want you to be able to communicate very clearly and effectively what you've achieved, how you're delivering as you go through the project and we will be offering you guidance um, from John here in terms of the establishment and delivery of communication strategies so that you can very clearly articulate out to your stakeholders and back to ourselves and ultimately the Commission what you have delivered as a result of your project. And that's it. So that's all I have to say at the moment. Um, hopefully that gives you a flavour for the backdrop of the programmes what we're looking to deliver in respect to some of the results and outputs within the, the environmental strand. We are very happy to take questions in a few moments um, and just answer whatever we can in and around that area. But what I'd like to do first of all before we go there is just to invite um, from our departmental colleagues' perspective just to give you a flavour and a sense of where the national priorities lie and the perspective the departments have taken on that. Um, just to give you that backdop and overview, so I'm going to ask um, Kieran O'Keefe and Owen Little to come forward and just give you a little bit of a sense of the departmental priorities from Northern Ireland and Ireland. I'm hoping that Jason uh, Watts will be with us from Scottish Natural Heritage shortly and he'll be then too, uh, available to discuss Scottish perspectives as well. But it's just really to give you that member state perspective in terms of what is relevant locally and to give you the clear sense in terms of how that works on a cross-border basis. Uh, as we move forward. So I'll just hand over um, to our colleagues here and then what we'll do is we'll come back then and we'll take question and answers just before we break for coffee. Thank you. Uh, first of all, good morning. Uh, my name is Owen Little from the Department of Environment. I took over the role of the EU funding team two weeks ago. So uh, if you test my shallowness and my knowledge on this area, fortunately I have more esteemed colleagues in, in the room in the form of uh, Dr. James Warnock and uh, Colin Armstrong, who will hopefully be able to answer any particular questions in the marine biodiversity areas. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and uh, to be involved in this project. Um, what I'm going to go through is um, look at the three areas and just um, outline slides uh, to give you a flavour of uh, where Northern Ireland uh, sees, in a, uh, what information Northern Ireland sees in the successful application and also some of the priority areas. Um, the slides contain a lot of detail. It's so that when uh, you're, you get the slides later on and print them off, it's got a, a bit more uh, worth to them. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail in each slide. There's a few uh, areas which I've been asked to emphasise, which are probably of uh, more worth. But on the marine protected species side, um, what we'll find is uh, that on the slides you have the output, uh, which uh, Helen or Lorraine's just discussed. Um, the areas uh, that the uh, successful project could include, and then what the Northern Ireland priorities are. So on this particular side here, um, what I've been asked to, to, to highlight is um, that um, th this can be broad, but the key thing is that the models have to support management decisions. So uh, when uh, looking forward to the, uh, putting your applications in for this, it's about particularly uh, uh, assisting management in making decisions to support this particular output. For this uh, output, um, the key uh, emphasis is on the Northern Ireland priorities and what the department sees as a focus will be with the County Down SPAs and the Murloc um, SAC. Just to make people make sure people are awake, the columns are the wrong way around there, I notice. So again, I'll, uh, this, uh, some of these slides just build on what Lorraine's already said, add in a bit more detail. And um, uh, within um, Northern Ireland, the, the key areas, um, the model for Northern Ireland, Donegal, and live bathing waters uh, uh, of importance. Uh, moving on to the freshwater um, area, um, I think the, the the key point to emphasis in this area is about the aspect of um, groundwater and 
about an integrated catchment um, uh, management uh, system. Um, the output indicator, uh, 50 cross-border uh, groundwater monitoring wells installed, contributes to improved data collection supporting the river water quality improvement projects, which link to include free river water quality improvement projects. Uh, the location of the wells um, will be on both sides of the border to support the monitoring and land use, and therefore uh, anticipated actions could have activities uh, related to groundwater monitoring wells, data management, and supporting river water um, improvements. But the key aspect here is that it's um, the groundwater uh, con uh, monitoring wells contributes to the overall uh, catchment plan. As Lorraine mentioned, there's going to be um, further information uh, provided. Uh, I've been informed that uh, this information will be ready uh, by uh, the end of this week, early this week, and then will be posted to the relevant websites. Uh, there's no one from this particular uh, area here today, but the email address is at the bottom of the, the screen if you have further information. But as I said, that uh, further information should be available uh, shortly. On the biodiversity or protected habitats and priority species area, um, there has been some uh, concerns raised from consortiums uh, about some of the uh, requirements. And, uh, James Warnock, uh, just before this um, presentation, uh, just confirmed me that the jurisdictions have actually uh, come to some sort of agreement, and uh, this information should be uh, out shortly to assist you. And that's the uh, normal priorities for the uh, output for the 4,500 hectares. As I said, um, James and uh, Colin are here in the audience, so on the marine and biodiversity side there is some sort of expertise here to answer any questions later on, but uh, hopefully there's uh, enough information on those slides to actually uh, give you an outline of the priorities of where Northern Ireland will be looking for applications uh, in these uh, outputs. Thank you. Good morning. Just while the slides are coming up, I'm Kieran O'Keefe, and I work for the National Parks and Wildlife Service in the Department of Arts, Heritage, and the Gaeltacht in Dublin. Now, my particular knowledge area is Objective 2 1, the recovery of protected habitats and priority species. I have a couple of slides that colleagues in the Department of the Environment gave to me in regard to the fresh water. I won't be talking to the marine. Broadly speaking, what I would say is what you've seen so far. Um, in the last presentation in particular, in regard to what a successful project could include, uh, applies uh, south of the border as well. So what I really want to do in my few minutes here is just to talk about what we can provide and also where our priorities come from. So uh, as with Northern Ireland and Scotland, we have produced a prioritised action framework in regard to Natura 2000, which is on our website. And that might be a good starting point where we identified the key priorities over the next number of years. Um, also, the Article 17 reporting process, which determines the status of habitats. And finally, we have a national peatland strategy, which is focused in the first instance largely on, blank, on raised bogs because of um, particular infringement situations with the EU. But we have a national peatland strategy and uh, the long-term protection of blanket bogs uh, is of importance. So <clears throat> these are the key habitats that we have in Ireland and the key species. In terms of reaching the, the, the key output indicator of, of, of area, I guess blanket bog is very important within that. And you'll see if you go to our website for material, uh, we have mapping of the various sites that apply. The most obvious thing that sticks out from this, I think, is that the bulk of them are in the, the western seaboard area. Um, and the second thing then I think is that probably blanket bogs is an area where we have to look to provide us um, if, we're, if we're looking at the south uh, for reaching the, the, uh, the area targets. And I just wanted to give you a feel of what you can get if you go to our website, and I'm not sure Lorraine, is this also on SEUP or is your website or a link to it at any rate? 
So we have the list of sites that are relevant. We have a lot of supporting information and data. And uh, then we have a, a series of mapping. We also are working particularly at the moment on conservation objectives for sites. We had done a lot of work uh, 10 years ago and more towards management plans and conservation act, uh, action plans. And that material may be useful to you. And if you want, uh, outside of uh, you know, coffee or whenever, we can have a brief chat. I can put you in touch with people who may be able to lead you to, at this stage, slightly old material, but which nonetheless will have the framework of material that would be useful in the drawing up of projects. And if you delve into it, there's more detail. I don't think we need to go into this, but it provides you on a site-by-site -site basis information, and you can mine down into that to get information further on the sites that would be appropriate to the project. If I can move briefly to information provided to me in the water framework, uh, from the water framework director from the Department of the Environment. So the, um, my colleague Catherine Comer from Environment, I think, is here. Catherine is just here. And mainly what we can do today, I think, is put you in touch with relevant people uh, in due course if you want to talk to us outside of the room. Um, so you're well familiar, I think, probably those of you who are interested in this area of, the, of, the, of Interreg with the WFD. Um, and the second cycle of river basin management plans are currently being devised uh, and will be in place by the end of 2017. And I guess the important thing is that new governance arrangements are in place uh, for these river basin management plans. There's going to be National Local Authority Water and Communities Office, uh, consisting of a number of supporting officers there. And uh, this would be an important resource. So I would suggest probably the best thing, if you want to pursue this line from this meeting, if you would talk to Catherine about who to speak to in environment, and I'll help as best I can. So that's really all I want to say. We are not going to be project uh, proposers as such in, uh, in our department. We just simply don't have the resources. So I see our function very much as supporting uh, groups who wish to put together proposals. And we will try to do that both at a national level and also at a local level with staff who would know a lot of these sites well. And that would apply also to relevant parts of the marine proposal, for example, in relation to marine management planning, where there is a possibility for some work on uh, sites that are close to the border in the south as well as in the north. I think that's probably all I can usefully provide for now, and I'm very happy to talk then afterwards. Can I ask you to stay with us, maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay, well I'm just going to ask Kieran and uh, Owen to come up and join us here and we're happy now to open for question and answers. Um, in the world of modern technology we have also got our first question coming in um, remotely uh, across our live stream. So the first question that has come in and it's a question from Catherine Bertrand and she's just asked here um, really in respect to habitats. Do habitats and area, areas of habitat in Scotland, does that count towards the result indicator? And I'd just like to respond on that one to say, yes, they do. Um, and if you take a look at the cooperation program, uh, which is available on our website, you will see on page 56 of the cooperation program in table 2.a.5, get right that one down, 2.a.5, in uh, the table, it indicates within that that in many cases, sites will be close to or straddle the border. However, other sites further from the terrestrial border, including those in Western Scotland, may be included where the site is of cross-border significance. So yes, the answer is sites in Scotland can count towards that output indicator of 4,500 hectares of habitats to be in a better conservation status by the end of the investment. So that's our first remote question. Can I maybe now open to the floor? Um, and if you just indicate who you are and the area that you're representing and then which member of the panel or myself you'd like to answer the question. Uh, hello, uh, Fergal McGrath from the Marine Institute. Um, we're interested in the uh, marine objective. Just to follow on from the first question, um, can you identify the geographical limits of the marine area, please? Okay. Um, well, that's something in terms of the um, mapping with the departments, it's something that we are obviously looking at. Now, within the marine environment, um, obviously, it's where do you stop? Um, we have an eligible area in terms of the eligible area for the program in terms of um, sort of a terrestrial border and the counties that would be appropriate. Um, we'd obviously be looking to try and establish, 
you know, the outer reaches in terms of what the eligible areas in respect to the marine environment as well. However, this is one of the areas of the programme whereby if there's something particular that needs to be undertaken, we have the scope to indicate if an area is slightly further south or slightly um, further out in terms of the marine environment, that we have the opportunity there in terms of that 20% limit on programme investment outside the eligible area, which would give us some scope for flexibility. And in that respect, I would be saying to you probably, tell us what it is that you want to do and where you need to do it and why it's appropriate to do it there. And we would assess that as part of your project proposal. But we're looking at the marine environment in terms of the um, area around Northern Ireland, obviously, the border counties that mirror the border counties in terms of the terrestrial environment um, under the programme. And we also then have Western Scotland and all of the waters in between. But if you tell us what you want to do and where you want to do it, and then we look at the appropriateness of that in respect to the programme outputs and indicators. Okay. I don't know if either of you would like to add to that. Kieran, would you? Okay. All right. Any other questions? And one down the back, and then we'll come to yourself here in the front. Um, Anita Donaghy, uh, Birdwatch Ireland. Hi. I just wanted to ask whether all the sites that are listed in the Republic of Ireland um, contribute towards the overall target of 4,500 hectares. Okay. Kieran, would you like to respond to that one? or? I think I'm going to have to defer possibly to Paul, but my understanding is that species sites themselves don't contribute. Is that correct? Uh, so we have a list, and um, if you look at the website, um, we have identified an, a range of sites. Those would be the priorities for action. Again, if you think that you've got something very specific in terms of a, a, a habitat which is not mapped at the moment in terms of one of the sites that are identified or something very specific that you think is important to bring in, I would encourage you to come forward and speak to Paul and just make direct contact, explain what you want to do, and we look at that in respect to whether or not that can fit within the results and output indicators. But we do have uh, a range of sites identified both in Northern Ireland and Ireland and also Western Scotland in terms of priorities for action. Yes, of course, Kieran. Just one additional thing. Under the Habitats Directive, the sites that we've designated, there are no sites that are designated uniquely for species. Um, so that could be of some assistance in some particular cases. But of course, the, I guess that question, Anita, is focused more on SPAs and sites that are specifically bird sites only. Do you, want, do you want to come back on that? Thank you. Yeah. Obviously, there's a range of sites um, included on the map which are yes. not designated, but they're identified as important sites where the program funds are be, to be directed. So I'm just kind of... There, there is a little bit of a mishmash there yeah. in terms of specific species, and yeah. some of those species will come in and they will have particular locations either in terms of you know, overwintering birds or whatever, whereby they have particular places that they come and they frequent, which may not appear on, those, on that list. And those, we do have a list of species. We will need to demonstrate through the delivery of the program that we're delivering all of the habitat hectorage in terms of the output indicator, but we have the scope within the program to allow us to also work with and to deliver a program of activity which is related to specific species, which may take you slightly beyond the, the mapped sites in terms of those that are deemed to be of um, priority and significance in terms of the specific habitat, but we would need to look at that quite carefully and make sure that that's not impacting on our ability to deliver it on the 4,500 hectares across the program. So it may be part of an overall project in terms of a suite of activity if it w was the entirety of your project to work in areas that were outside the designated and identified sites that may present complication. Okay, we have one here at the front, John. Hello, I'm Abel Ann McElarney Hammond from the Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute. Um, I have two questions. First is in relation to the habitats and species theme. Uh, there's really good information on the websites regarding the maps and the areas and species, but I was wondering, um, the information that has been supplied gives us two sets of areas, one on the whole SAC area and the other on the specifically named designated habitat that is in the proposal. So I was wondering when we add up to the four and a half thousand hectares, are we going by the actual area of the specific designated named habitat in the in the coal or is it specifically the whole area of the SEC? Do you want to come in on that guys? 
James. I can just invite James here from NIEA as well. Hi, uh, and this question has been raised before, um, and we've given the example if you had a site that is 100 hectares, but it supported 75 hectares of the qualifying feature, yep. then the 75 hectares of the qualifying feature would be what is recorded as an output indicator. But there may also be circumstances where you're working across the entirety of a site and you're working towards an output indicator at the 100 hectares, even though it doesn't support the output indicator, we'd be asking applicants to demonstrate how they are working towards the output indicator. So okay. in the main, it's toward working towards the qualifying feature, but if you can demonstrate you're doing work in another area, such as blocking drains, which might benefit a fan on an area not necessarily supporting the feature, but supporting the entirety of the site, we would be content with that as well. Okay. And I think really within your project proposal, it's just defining what you're doing and where you're doing that in terms of your proposed actions. Now, obviously, within a stage one application, and Paul will explain this to you in a little bit more detail um, after coffee break, the level of detail that we'll get involved in at that within your stage one application, you'll not be identifying specific works and actions in particular locations. That will be more um, likely to be at stage two. Um, but if you, obviously, our key priority is in respect to those um, priority habitats and species. However, if there are other areas in terms of um, providing buffer zones or if there are areas there in terms of my, you know, allowing movement of um, priority species and so on, build that and demonstrate the relevance, demonstrate the importance of it and why the investment in that actually contributes to the work that you're doing in respect to those priority habitats and species so that we understand what the added value is in delivering out that work and why the budget investment in that particular activity area, why that makes a difference. Okay, you had a second question? Okay. Um, the second question was in relation to the freshwater river basins. Um, there was 11 potential basins supplied there by DOE, and I was just wondering, are they suggestions, or are they specifically set in stone regarding the, the study catchments, or do MPWFS or EPA have similar catchments they can provide. Okay, Kieran, maybe let you come in in terms no, of the... I'm just not competent to answer that. Um, so I can, I can have a chat afterwards, maybe, okay. and put you in the direction of the right people to talk to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Hello, I'm Gordon Gray Stevens from the Argyle and Coast uh, Countryside Trust. Uh, a question, uh, coming back to the, uh, to the first question, to get a bit more clarification, on what uh, cross-border significance is. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit more about your thoughts on that or if there are any plans to publish further details on what cross-border? No, yeah, there are no plans to publish further details on it at this point, and I think that from an applicant's point of view, that's a good thing. So we have, we've got that definition. We now have flexibility and scope in terms of how we interpret that definition in terms of what is of cross-border significance. We'll obviously be um, tapping in with our colleagues in terms of member states. Um, Jason, I've just heard, is unable to be with us today, but we will, you know, touch base with him in that regard. And as long as we can demonstrate that you've got a rationale and a justification for why you believe and that that's accepted, that it is of cross-border uh, significance, then we can move forward. So uh, we're not intending to put any further definition in at this point, and we would prefer that if you've got a proposal, that you put that forward with your proposal, and then we can look at uh, the rationale that you've presented in that regard. Thank you. Pamela Arthurs from East Border Region. Um, I just want to tease out the lead partner um, element a wee bit more. Um, you know, uh, as most of you in the room will know, we have been lead partner on a number of Interreg 4A projects, and with that comes the responsibility um, for all of the grant aid. But what seems to be uh, really um, is heightened in this program, and maybe lead partners really need to be aware of it. Um, I don't know that it comes across strongly because I certainly wasn't um, aware of this until lately. But I suppose the two key things this time is, in the first instance, the lead partner needs to demonstrate the capacity to repay all of the grant aid, irrespective of who is a budget holder or who's spending as partners. The lead partner will be assessed, and if I'm saying this wrong, Lorraine, um, you contradict me, but the lead partner will be assessed 
in their capacity to repay all of the money. Because if there is a problem, then that's who SEUPB will um, be looking to, solely the lead partner, not the partners. So therefore, your partnership agreements are very important with your partners. But the other emphasis, I think, as well, that doesn't come across strongly is, whereas in the past, the lead partner would have been concerned about the spend of their partners and making sure that the spend was eligible because they're solely responsible. This time, it's around the results. So you might have spent properly, but if you don't achieve the result, the lead partner may still be asked to repay the money. So I think that's very significant because there's a new dimension here around these results. It's very, very clear. Um, and I think particularly for the habitats and the species, where you look at the range of potential either lead partners or partners, their capacity to pay, there's very few of them could demonstrate the capacity to repay. So I think that's a, an issue in this particular element of the programme, which makes it difficult for them. And the other just comment before I finish is to say on you know, the results indicator, um, it really does sort of confuse me, this little or a lot collaboration. I think it's so weak. You know, surely um, a cross-border programme is around collaboration, about cross-border collaboration, about joint management, joint financing, whatever. I just think that's kind of a willy um, result indicator, which maybe is a good thing because it could maybe be achieved easier, I don't know. But um, so that's just, I mean, to make that clear, am I right in terms of the responsibilities of the lead partner this time? Okay. Um, in terms of lead partners, yes, the lead partner is the organisation that we will establish a contract via the letter of offer with. So whoever that organisation is that's coming forward, um, the chances are you're going to be engaged with a number of partners. It's not going to be one organisation, although it could be if it's a cross-border organisation which can demonstrate um, the jurisdictional relevance in terms of what they do as an organisation and the fact that they can work on a, a cross-border basis. But in the main, we're expecting that we're going to have collaborative um, arrangements between more than one organization. So whoever that lead partner organization is, that is the applicant to ourselves, that's the organization that we will establish the letter of offer with and that will be ultimately tasked with responsibility to make sure that the project gets delivered and that all of the different partners deliver out on their component parts. Now, what I would say is that, in, certainly in my experience, we have never had a project yet which has been withdrawn out of the program in its entirety. Um, I think there may have been one or two isolated incidences across programs in terms of European funded programs in our area, but we haven't had yet. So in terms of the requirement to extract an entire project out and reimburse the full value of that project, I think that would be an extreme circumstance and we're not anticipating that that would be the case. However, you have results and outputs there, which are established within the cooperation program that we have to demonstrate that we will deliver. So we'll be looking at the, um, the proposals that come forward in terms of whether they are realistic, whether or not they are deliverable, whether or not the partnership coming together has got the capacity to deliver out on that um, particular output. So we don't want to stymie um, innovation completely, but we do want you to work from the premise that whatever you're proposing, that you start out on the basis and the understanding that whatever you say you're going to deliver, you're going to deliver. We can't continue to keep paying for lots of activities and lots of people to go and plant trees, dig holes, put up fences, unless it actually has the potential and will deliver out on the output within the program. You could spend a lot of money and it could make no difference. You could spend a lot of money and it could make a huge and demonstrable difference. It's the demonstrable difference that we're looking for. Now, what, if we were to identify that there was a difficulty with the project, that the activities and the actions and um, the process of implementing that project was not implementing the result and output, that's something that we'll be keeping a close eye on right from the outset of the project and we'd be expecting all of yourselves to do that too. So we are not going to be in a position whereby we walk away, we don't take any interest in terms of what you're delivering until you get to the end of it, and then turn around and go, oh, sh it's a shame you haven't delivered. It is an ongoing process of communication, engagement right from the beginning of the project through to the end to make sure that you are content, that we are content, that everything is going according to plan, and that the incremental change that you're seeing on the ground is reflecting the fact that you are delivering out on the results and outputs that you have signed on to deliver. 
So that would be the first thing. However, if there are items of ineligible expenditure, if something is not procured properly, if it's something that's not eligible under the program that you've gone and spent the money and we realize actually that's not in accordance with the rules, Pam, that's quite right. We will be going back to the lead partner and if the lead partner, we say, I'm sorry, that's ineligible. It's up to the lead organization to then do whatever they need to do with their project partners to say, there's not gonna be reimbursement under that particular cost center. You can't get that back, it's not eligible and to rework or do whatever is required at project level to um, resolve that situation. However, again, I would reference that we will be giving, and there's already very clear guidance on eligibility out there. So that is your starting point. That is your reference guide right from the beginning of the program. Make sure before you spend, make sure that you reference back to that documentation and make sure that what you're about to spend money on is eligible under the program. And if you're in doubt, contact us before you commit the money. Okay, but the lead partner is that link organization. We will be looking at the capacity of that organization, both in terms of the staffing structure, their management capability, their sectoral expertise within that area. So that when we're seeing proposals that is coming from a position of knowledge and understanding that you know what is set out is deliverable. And we're also looking at the capacity of the organization in terms of their financial capacity to deal with any financial issues that may arise during the course of the delivery of the project. Um, we are in an output orientated program. I know that that's not always easy in respect to natural environment projects. Um, we will be asking you when you're looking at the development of your project proposal and we can have a conversation with you at your stage two submission stage, which we'll, Paul will talk to you about um, after the coffee break. We will be in conversation with you as to what realistically you will be able to measure by the end of your project in 2020, 2021, 2022, what can you realistically expect to have delivered at that point in time? And if you're talking about habitat restoration, you may be able to demonstrate that you're on a path on a continuum to get to a particular um, status or a particular um, you know, vi visible representation of good habitat um, conservation status at that point. You'll be d telling us about the change, but what we need to understand from yourselves, we are not habitat specialists ourselves, but we're very happy and delighted to have um, the uh, support and the interest of the member state departments. What we ask you to demonstrate, however, with your proposal is what can you meaningfully and what are you aiming to demonstrate, deliver, and that we can measure by the time you come to the end of the financial package, bearing in mind that it is a short-term finance and that some of these um, changes may take longer periods of time to see come to complete fruition. In respect to the indicator on the marine, um, you know, it is what it is in terms of the indicator there. Um, I think it's useful in some regards in that we've got an indicator which is very much about collaboration, which is a core tenant of the programs. Um, it leaves us with flexibility to demonstrate and define exactly what that change, what that increased collaboration, what that increased management capacity and capability on a cross-border basis is. So it gives us flexibility. Um, it's a, a toss up. Is more specific helpful or is less specific helpful? You know, there are pros and cons with both approach. It is what's defined within the cooperation program and that's what we will be using as we deliver out. And I hope that the flexibility is advantageous as we move forward in that regard. Okay. That's perfect, thank you. Okay, so we're just gonna wrap up there. We're just right on um, the button for tea and coffee. We are happy to take any further questions from you over the coffee break. Um, and obviously there'll be another opportunity for you um, later on this morning. One remaining, sorry, one remaining. Yes. Just one additional comment here from NIEA. Yeah, yeah Colin Armstrong from Department of Environment and Marine Division. Lorraine, the, the um, the agreed result for the marine, what may be useful to just put a little bit more clarity on that is actually how the result is assessed because the departments did complete a questionnaire um, which sort of puts a little bit more detail on what is meant by collaboration. So I think there was, from memory, there was three or four questions that we did answer and we will be asked to again respond yeah. to that in two or three years time and then it is that questionnaire that will be repeated at the end of the program and it might be appropriate just to to share that with folks to see maybe what is meant by yes collaboration and we can make that available. because that has been agreed with the commission about yeah. what they would be seeing the result to be okay that's wonderful thank you we'll make that available um and what we might do uh, perhaps if you is it possible to even jot those down on one of the flip charts um over the coffee break colin and then we can at least people have sighted that but we will make it available on our website in any case 
Um, we will break for, for coffee now. Um, very happy to say to take further questions. The flip charts are there, so if you have an interest, and perhaps you may have more than one interest in different um, areas, you're sitting at a table at the moment representing one sectoral area, but you might have an interest in others as well, please feel free to leave your details on the flip charts. Um, and for those that are live streaming, we will also take any details that you send through to ourselves as well and make that available on our website afterwards. Um, and we'll aim to bring you back into the room at a quarter two. So we'll break now for 15 minutes for tea and coffee. And we'll see you back then to talk about the application process just after the coffee break. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. My name's uh, Paul Boylan. I'm the uh, Interreg Program Manager. Uh, welcome to those who are streaming live. I understand there was about 10 to 15 people streaming into the event earlier this morning, so let's see if we get the same audience again this afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk you through the application process, both stage one and stage two. Um, you know, I'm delighted to be able to tell you that we've got 72 million to give out. It's a sizable amount of money to make a real difference to the region, and often think in the, the bureaucracy of things that we get lost in the overall output, which is to make a difference to this region. And I think this what this European money could, could effectively do. And as Lorraine outlined this morning, it's about a change, a change to an output focus. Whereas previously, we knew what we wanted to achieve by results, but we didn't know the means by which to achieve it. This time around, we're spelling out the means by which to achieve it in the outputs. And that's what I'm going to talk you through today, the application form and how we're asking you to present your case to achieve the outputs. So the application process. There's a two-stage process which was similar to the 2012 call for Interreg, which seems to work quite successfully. Um, so the stage one is a fairly high-level initial application and we normally open the call for four to six weeks. In the case of your projects, we've opened it for nearly 10 weeks. We appreciate that it's a long leading time for the environmental projects, given the complex nature and the consultation that you have to undertake with stakeholders and the engagement that you have to, to do in order to form your partnerships. So we have a reasonably high level succinct application form. That application form is available on our website. And from the date you submit the application form, we would hope to give you a decision by the steering committee on the stage one approval within eight weeks. Um, and then we would invite you to come forward with a stage two business plan. I'm gonna talk a bit about that uh, this afternoon as well. And within that stage two business plan, it's gonna be much more detailed and we're looking for you to submit that within six weeks. And then we'll give you a decision on funding within 22 weeks. So all in, the process is a 36-week process from date of stage one application being submitted to receiving a letter of offer. So that's a real commitment which we've given in, in a, an improved time frame on what, uh, what we had previously delivered. So once we receive the stage one application, we're looking first and foremost on whether or not it's eligible. So was it received on time? That's, a, that's an obvious uh, one, and that's one which our auditors are very hot on, particularly when it comes to dates and times. We've got very clearly spelled out in our call documentation that it has to be received by 3 p.m. So uh, beware, it has to be with us by 3 p.m. So try and make an effort, if you are submitting an application, to do it well in advance of that 3 p.m. deadline in case there are any technical difficulties. The application has to be authorized by the eligible person, whether that be the CEO or accounting officer. The project must not be fully completed before it's submitted. We can fund retrospectively in some cases, but the project must not be fully completed. It has to benefit the eligible region, as Lorraine talked about earlier. We can look at funding aspects outside the eligible region, but it has to benefit the eligible region. And, and then the activities need to be eligible according to the, both the rules of the program and spell out in the call documentation. So that's the high level eligibility check which we undertake when it arrives on our desk uh, when you submit the application form. And we, do, we tend to do that very quickly. So what are we assessing at both stage one and stage two? I'll just touch on this because I'm going to go into it in much more detail. 
So uh, at stage one, we are looking for the five criteria that will be considered. That's results and output orientation, quality of project design, cross-border cooperation, governance, and value for money. Those five key areas will be assessed and be given equal weighting at stage one. At stage two, when we're looking at the business plan, we extend that a bit further to include sustainable development and equality. That's two statutory criteria that have to be considered according to the regulations. And we're actually running workshops on those as an organization. So SEUPB are hosting a workshop on the 24th of November uh, on equality, and there will be a further workshop on sustainable development. Uh, where we'll detail what we expect to see within sustainable development. And I'll touch a little bit on it today. Okay, so the selection criteria at stage one, I, I've just basically outlined that there. But these are the, the, the details which I'm going to sort of tease out a bit over the coming few slides here. It's how your project contributes towards the results and outputs of the program. And this is what we've been talking the length of the, the presentations today. It's about the outputs and how you're going to achieve the outputs and how you're going to evidence you achieve the outputs. The quality of the project design, the quality of the project team and implementation arrangements. Again, who's doing what and why? These are some of the key criteria um, that, that, that we'll be looking at. Value for money, it's evident everything that we do has to demonstrate value for money and particularly difficult in the environment sphere because the funding from member states is so tight that we need to be sure that we are really demonstrating value for money and I would anticipate that you have a lot of evidence of where you've demonstrated value for money in the past which we would like you to bring forward in your application to support it and so forth. Quality of cross-border cooperation, I'll go into that and again sustainable development and equality at stage two. So, what kinds of projects are we going to support? Well, first and foremost, projects that deliver the results and outputs in line with what we've detailed in our programme. And I think what we've done, uh, what we ha which we haven't done in previous programmes, has been very clear about that. I appreciate that there's some technical terminology still to be worked out around management plans and so forth, but we will add more flesh to that uh, in the form of a paper coming out shortly on what we see as uh, management plans, marine plans, and so forth to try and flesh out. But I would say, as a matter of principle, that we always start at the European standard and then apply where we go down to the member states, uh, the, the nuances, and where we can find commonality. So as a point of principle, if we're looking for a standard, it's always the European standard that we start at. Again, projects must be cross-border, and I can't stress that enough. Lorraine mentioned this morning about fulfilling the four criteria, and I would uh, endorse that again, that it is imperative that we support the four criteria. Corporate governance and partnership arrangements, that's what we would expect to be in place. It's not a big ask uh, in terms of what people are expected to deliver, because there is a degree of risk associated with the projects, particularly with the output focus, we would expect the partnerships to be very tight and, and put governance arrangements in place so that the, the, the risk is mitigated and the roles and responsibilities are clear. Again, quality of project design. What have you done previously that worked and why does it apply in this situation? You need to detail that. Value for money, again, I touched on before, and then sustainability and equality. They have the, pro the project seven themes that you must, must uh, address in the application process. So the stage one form, it's in your pack, and you should all have a copy of that, but it's relatively light touch, and we've, we've uh, increased the character count to allow you to flesh out some detail as well. So what we are looking for is the, the tick box, obviously, what you're looking to apply under and then the project location. And we'll obviously have detailed site maps and so forth, and you're welcome to reference that when you're putting in your project locations. Uh, again, you need to set out and evidence why your project will contribute to the results and outputs of the program. We appreciate that the result isn't always within your gift, but the output should certainly be within your gift, and the output is what we will be holding you to account against should you be successful in getting a letter of offer. Uh, and again, how that directly aligns with the programme 
outputs and, and, and broader text in the cooperation programme. Um, I appreciate that you, you may not have read the cooperation programme, but I would say is that if you are putting in an application to stage one, I think it's worth reading the relevant sections for which you're applying for funding for and, and getting into some of the nitty gritty, because that's what we've agreed with the Commission and that's what we will be holding potential projects to account against. Okay, so what are we ultimately looking to fund under the project design? Well, it's well-designed, high-quality projects. What we've seen, that may sound an obvious statement, but what we've seen in the past is where there is project ideas which haven't been fleshed out, and when we come to deliver them, they've not been able to, to come to fruition and they've quickly dissipated. So what we need is strong rationale and strong design as to why you're doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it. Uh, and ultimately, what are you trying to achieve? What's the way in which you're trying to achieve that? And how you will target the beneficiaries. So if it's 4,500 hectares, how you will do that? Are you, uh, James touched on earlier this morning uh, about going for a, a larger area and, and, and concentrating on getting the at least two, uh, three quarters of that in terms of changing the habitat conditions. So have a think about that when you're putting your application together. Think about how you flesh that out in the, in the application process. And then addressing any sub-criteria. So in the sub-criteria for each project, we have selection criteria in the call. So it may be compliance with water framework directive or so forth, but that's in there in terms of the sub-criteria. So look at the call documentation and reference that when you're completing your project design. Okay, uh, cross-border added value and why are you doing it on a cross-border basis? You must be able to demonstrate that it is jointly developed and jointly implemented. And again, whether or not it's jointly staffed and or jointly financed, and again, we would encourage you to do both. But what we need to be clear on is why you have the, sit the partners around the table that you do. Is there anyone obvious missing? Why are they missing? Have you consulted them? That's the sort of things that we will pick up on during the assessment process, the gaps in the information. Uh, we will be putting the stage one application to a steering group for, uh, with a recommendation, but that steering group will have uh, within it member states who are very uh, clear on their own policy areas and responsibilities, so they'll come with a very educated view to discuss the application. And we also have environmental experts, and we reserve the right as well, uh, should we feel that we need to, to appoint an independent expert to advise SEUPB on the assessment process and why we have the people around the table that we do have. Okay, uh, in terms of the quality of the project team and the implementation arrangements, we would expect to see a management structure in place, a staffing structure, and a reporting mechanism in place. So uh, you may apply project methodology, that's up to you, but what we would like to see is very clear operational management structures in place for your project, and you have to detail that in your stage one application. And then we would expect to see evidence that a partnership has the right mix of experience and skills, as I touched on a moment ago. So the project partners, you need to tell us a bit about the project partners and why they're involved. We have a section uh, within the application form where we ask you for your project partner's experience. So if you're bringing someone on board to deliver something, we would expect to see that they have the requisite skill set or statutory responsibility or uh, area of expertise to, to, to add value to your project. And then that obviously has to come with whether or not they have a budget or they're in advisory capacity. And, and you need to detail that in the stage one application form. And, and this is where, we're at, to date, we've seen a lot of projects not necessarily have the, the detail at stage one which we would anticipate. We would expect some fairly high level figures at stage one, but we would expect to have a sort of degree of rationale behind those figures at the stage one application stage. So that the financial management and financial reporting systems would obviously have to be in place. Who's going to be the budget holders? When are they going to report? How are they going to report? What, are there their own um, center of procurement excellence? Are you going to uh, use unit costs, for instance, which we'll come on to later? Um, uh, how are you going to go out to market if you're doing it on a 
tripartite basis? Are you going to advertise in the EU journal? These are all the things that you have to consider. And then cash flow arrangements, uh, Pamela uh, touched on that this morning about the, the degree of liability uh, for, the, for the project because projects are output focused and outputs don't come to fruition until the end of a project lifetime. The degree of liability resting with the lead partner is considerable for the reimbursement should they fail to meet the output. So we're looking for a degree of evidence as to why the project can bankroll themselves in terms of quarterly claims and in terms of exposure to the outputs should that rest with them in the end. Do they have a reserve policy? These are the sorts of things that we're asking projects to come forward with. We're not going to be really hard and fast uh, around percentages or anything like that, but what we're asking you to do is ask yourself the questions before we ask them and present the answers and we can have a, an open and honest discussion. Um, again, the detailed breakdown of the costs, if, if the predominant uh, budget rests with one partner, why does it rest with one partner? Is it because they are doing the procurement exercise or uh, are they actually going to funnel the, the, the money through the, through the other partners? It needs to be clear why you have the breakdown of funding across the partners uh, that uh, you do. And then sustainability, uh, you know, who, if we are creating uh, uh, an improvement, who's going to sustain that improvement and how are you going to evidence that going forward? Okay, I appreciate it. it may feel like a lot of information for a stage one application, but I think what we are looking for is statements of fact and, and, and some some just high-level remarks around those so that some of the assumptions are taken out of the equation for us because it is evidenced, and that's what I have to stress. It's evidence, evidencing why you're putting down on your application form what you're putting down. Okay, so the partner budgets, again, we have the six, uh, sorry, seven budget lines, sorry, six budget lines there, um, which you can draw upon, and we would expect you to to detail against those fairly self-explanatory budget lines. If you have any questions around, should I put it under this heading or that heading, I'm quite happy to answer that. And Helen's here today. She has considerable amount of experience in verifying claims already. So we have a fair idea of where costs should go. And then, uh, again, within the sub-partners, we're going to have a degree of flexibility. Uh, I mentioned unit costs earlier. Um, our gut instinct against uh, this uh, environment theme is that a unit cost may not be applicable, but we're not saying that you can't present us with a unit cost um, for the application. Uh, the, the difficulty that we see is that a management plan may cost 200,000 euros or may cost 60,000 euros, depending on the size, scope, nature. So we don't want to, to uh, restrict anyone in their application by limiting the unit cost to X and therefore we feel it's probably best in this case to, to sort of veer away from unit costs, but we're open to anyone who wishes to suggest otherwise where there may be appropriate in their application to apply a unit cost. Uh, but again, there has to be a lot of historical data to support that unit cost, and that unit cost has to be agreed uh, ex ante, so in advance of a letter of offer being issued to any potential applicant. Uh, we have a very clear indirect cost, so we have a 15% against your staff uh, costs of overheads, which has proved really successful in the previous programme, whereby you no longer need to evidence your overheads. We simply apply a flat rate of 15% against your staff costs for overheads, so that's your phones, your office accommodation, heating, lighting, and, and so forth. And that's worked really well, and we don't want to see any of the paperwork in and around that. We just simply apply a flat rate of 15%. So I would encourage you to, to take that up in, in the process, and we will be applying that uh, at stage two as well. Okay, so the key issues for the stage one application are, uh, does it meet the results and outputs? providing evidence statements to support why you can undertake the activities to achieve the results and outputs. It's not enough just saying, I'm going to deliver 10 management plans. You need to state why you could deliver 10 management plans. You have experience, you have statutory responsibility, you have landowners and principal agreements. We need to know some of the detail around why you could achieve the, the outputs. 
and you need to evidence that in your application form. It's not a case of the statement has to be there. You have to support that statement through further statements of evidence. Uh, and that's been key for us in being able to attribute a score because when SUPB score the applications, we're scoring them based on an evidence level on a scale of one to five. And uh, when we look at that, it obviously starts off from little or no evidence at all to lots of evidence, uh, highly uh, effective in delivering the evidence and the output. So the, that's the scale that we're working on. So again, I draw your attention back to the, to the, the terminology around evidencing, and, and that's what we like to see. Are you going to deliver a robust project which is deliverable? There's no, there's no point in putting forward an application which is out with your area of responsibility because it then takes away on your ability to deliver that project. Uh, and we will certainly look for you to, to have an idea amongst your project partners that, that this is likely to succeed and it's not just simply a case of putting it out there and hoping it's going to stick. We need to have a degree of engagement so that we know that the project has, has a high likelihood of success. And, and are the right partners identified and engaged? I, I touched on that earlier. And then again, around EU and national regulatory requirements and policies, are you giving the requisite acknowledgement to the member states, but also the EU regulatory requirements? And again, does the proposal demonstrate value for money? So that's the stage one application process. And that application process is um, fairly succinct. The application form is available in your packs today and is available from download from our website. And I would ask that if you have any issues with that or any problems or anything, please feel free to pick up the phone and give us a call. Uh, my telephone details and email address is out on the call documentation. And, and unfortunately, my colleague, Kieran Hanna, can't be here today, but he's, he's assisting with the environment theme and is very much leading on aspects of it. So he, he will be, be in touch with you if you have any issues. So please feel free to bring them to me, and we'll be able to work with you to, to find solutions to the issues. OK, the business plan. This is the more uh, weighty document. So if you are successful at stage one, we would then invite you to uh, put forward a business plan to SEPB. The likelihood is that in advance of you submitting that business plan, we'll have a discussion with you about your project proposal and, and give you advice and guidance as to what we would like to see in your business plan and the specifics. But what I do have at this stage is the business plan guide, which is a, a fairly uh, comprehensive guide to applicants, which satisfies ourselves and also the member states who are uh, in most cases putting forward the match funding to, to fund the projects up to 100%. So there are <clears throat> several aspects to the business plan which I'm going to go through now. Uh, but what I would like to pick out is some of the key aspects, the ones in bold there. Again, the proposed projects, we need you to set out in a very succinct summary why you're achieving the results and outputs. The need and demand has to be evidenced. This is, this is more around your, your, your options analysis and so forth and what you've considered. The budget and financial projections, that's going to be a key area where we're going to hone in on. And then the management uh, arrangements, resource and governance, again, I touched on at stage one. That's going to be key at stage two, and we'll expect it to be fleshed out further at stage two. Uh, almost down to staffing numbers and details as to whether the staff are seconded or uh, they're, they're coming in externally and so forth. So that's the level of detail that we're getting down. Monitoring and evaluation arrangements, uh, particularly if your project uh, is, is likely to have key milestones or an evaluation halfway through which will then inform activity, we need to have monitoring and evaluation uh, arrangements in place in your business plan and then an exit strategy. That, that, the exit strategy is key for me. We should begin with the end in mind when you're developing in a business plan. Is what, where are we going to go when we walk away from this and what is the legacy that we're going to leave and who's going to be taking care of that and who's got the statutory responsibility and so forth. So that's, that's one of the key elements. I'll just talk you through, through those now. So the project idea, again, what are the facilities that are proposed? Uh, you might not know that in some cases, Please detail that, that you don't know that. At this stage, we're do simply doing a mapping exercise, which will then inform uh, how we undertake the activities. 
Uh, so you need to detail that, but we anticipate the activities will be X. You know, you need to flesh that out in your business plan and make clear to us why you're proposing what you're proposing. And then the services to be provided, if you're providing advice, guidance, and workshops, how are you going to do that? Are you going to host it in external venues? Are you going to use um, existing council premises to do these things? These are the, the, the things that we'd like to know and how that will ultimately get the result uh, and the output which we've, we've asked for. And then, um, <clears throat> what are the critical success factors? What does your project hang on? Uh, does it mean uh, planning permissions? Is it um, dependent on uh, climate change measures? Uh, is it dependent on other things out with your sphere of responsibility, but all going well, that if you deliver this and everybody else plays their part, then that should come together? We would like that detailed because that's a, a risk to your project and it's critical to your success factor. Um, uh, you know, we can't predict how others are going to behave and react, particularly political systems and so forth. So it's it's trying to understand it and and detail why you think your your intervention will get you the result that you that you want and why the dependents are critical in your success. Um, and then again, the results and outputs. I can't stress that enough. It's just a, a, a basic need and demand. When we are justifying the funding, we have to reflect on how, how we've arrived at the project. So obviously we have a demand for you to deliver the outputs and then you are going to supply that um, demand and then hopefully we'll have a project. But we need to bring it up a level in the business plan to justify it to, to the European Commission, to the member states who are providing the match funding. So we will expect to be, see that in the business plan in a bit more detail. So in terms of the information available, we obviously have the site information available for habitats and species on, on our website, and we'll make reference to the, the uh, marine, the river basins data, sorry, on our, on our uh, website once that becomes available as well. So that's going to be out there. So there are third party information that are being brought to the fore, which you could reference as well, and we would expect to see that in a lot more detail at stage two. Um, again, management arrangements, the, the balance of delivery and appropriateness against the nature and scale of the organizations and partners involved. So if you have one organization at the heart of that uh, that, that uh, doesn't have control of the outputs, and that would give us concern because our contract is with that party and they, that party may not be able to deliver out on it. So we would sort of question, well, well, why are they the lead partner as opposed to someone who's actually got responsibility for delivering the the output on the ground, you know, these are the sort of things that, that would concern us and we would expect to see that fleshed out and details as to why you've chosen the partners that you've chosen and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and again, we talked about financial risk at the bottom there. Uh, some of the key areas which we've touched on in the past and which we've seen work and, and work well and in other cases not work as well is governance, you know, we don't want projects to be run back to back simultaneously and occasionally on an annual basis coming together and chatting about your experiences. It has to be integral. It's about sharing and it's about sharing the administration, it's about sharing the governance and the procedures and the arrangements. We obviously have to respect the jurisdiction in which you're operating in, but at the same time we ask that you detail exactly why you have the cross-border relationship that you do and how you're actively going to encourage and engage that cross-border relationship. And again, we're looking for procurement. Who's going to run the procurement exercise? Is it going to be done in the north? Is it going to be done in the south? Is it going to be done in Scotland? If you're doing it from Scotland, how is it going to impact in terms of exposure in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? These are all the questions that we're going to be asking you throughout the process. Uh, and again, we're looking for your procurement policies. So your organizations might have procurement policies, so we'd like you to present that. But if you then have five procurement policies because there's five partners, how do you agree a common policy? These will be the issues which we will ask you to address at stage two. Um, we expect there'll be a high 
success rate at stage two in terms of funding. So that's why we're going to such and such uh, a level of detail, because this will inform SEUPB both in the issue of the letter of offer, but will also inform the steering committee in their decision that the project's been well thought through and the business plan details all the potential risks and the viability of the organisations involved. So the calls are obviously open. Uh, the stage one closes on the 6th of January and we'll give you a decision on your success uh, or otherwise on or before the 5th of March um, next year. And we would hope to, to obviously then uh, feed back to any unsuccessful applications shortly thereafter and the successful applications, it's likely that we would want to meet with you as an organisation to help talk you through what we expect from your business plan at stage two and what we'd like to see in there. So we then ask you to submit your business plan generally within six weeks and providing it is submitted within six weeks, we'll be able to take it to a steering committee at stage two and give you a decision and a letter of offer on or before the 16th of September. So the very definitive dates that we have uh, out there and, and we are tied to those. We've put in the cooperation program, our 36 week process. We've published our timetables for calls. If there's any slippage in that timetables of, of calls, we have to detail on our website why there's been a slippage. But at this stage, we fully intend to deliver within that time frame. So I appreciate that was a bit of a, a rush through uh, a lot of the information there on the application process, but I would certainly welcome you at this point in time to, to ask any questions on the application process, stage one and stage two. Um, thank you. Just at the back of the room. Caroline Marshall, RSPB. You mentioned, Paul, about joint staff, and I just wondered what you actually mean by that. Do you mean one organisation employing all the staff? It doesn't have to be one organisation employing all the staff, but what you would occasionally, uh, on, on a number of projects, is they would set up a joint staffing structure where they would second staff into one unit to work pur purposefully on the project for a period of time. That unit doesn't have to be co-located in the same space. It could be a virtual unit whereby they're working uh, across jurisdiction or, or whatever, but we would expect to see that the people delivering out are actually the relevant people for both the responsibility, but also in terms of a, a team approach, and they are meeting regularly and discussing the, the issues of the entire project. What we've seen is people dotted in different spaces doing their own thing and then coming together annually. We would see it very much more a, a, a joint structure. There's four staff coming from four different organisations. They're going to meet monthly. They're going to be co-located. That's the type of thing that we would expect to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shane Woolsey from the PTO. Um, I have asked you a fundamental question, yes. which I know you'll come back to at some, some stage, yeah. but I've got a very, very practical question. Um, the application form, stage one application form, do, is it a Word document that we email to you, or is it an online document that must be filled in online? Okay. Uh, we're in the process of developing a database. Uh, we have a shared database with the other administrations in Northern Ireland and that there's been a, a slight delay on the delivery of that database. I would hope that we would have, by the turn of uh, the year, uh, a database that will be able to submit applications on for stage two. At stage one, because it is closing on the 6th of January, we would just expect you to submit, sorry, the 8th of January, uh, took two days off you there, sorry. Uh, uh, the 8th of January, uh, you would submit it in word form to ourselves on the, webs on the email address on the f call documentation. Okay, that informs my next question. Um, the, the, uh, you have room in here for, another very practical question, you have room in here for four partners. Um, we've got eight. Mm -hmm. So can we cut and paste and extend the form yes. as need be? Yes, you can, yes. 
Uh, that's not a problem to, to increase your partners. We, we, we put four in there as an average, and yeah, you could increase it out. That's not a problem. And then uh, on the budget part of the form, mm -hmm. you have uh, a section which uh, is for overheads calculation. So yeah. it, it really detailed, you know, sort of what the overheads might be. Uh, we don't need to fill that in. If, if you're applying the flat rate 15%, you do not need to fill that in. Do we have a choice? Yes, you can apply for direct flat rates, but it may, we may limit you to 15%. There would need to be a very good justification for it. We would have, in some cases, the exception rather than the rule. The rule should be 15% flat rate overhead, but there may be exceptions whereby we, we would deviate from that. Yeah, it, it, it could be lower, yeah. Question, sorry. Uh, Diane Foster, Northern Isle Water. I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first regards um, post-project evaluation, and would you be expecting us to factor in costs in our stage two application for this? Yes. Okay, uh, <laughs> the second question relates to uh, doing green book appraisals. Will you be carrying those out as part of the stage two application or would you be expecting us as applicants to, to do that? At this stage, we, we, would, we do not anticipate conducting full green book economic appraisals um, and we've not made that clear to, you know, we've, we've stated to applicants that that's not the intention that people will have to bear the burden and cost of a Green Book economic appraisal. Um, in the event that that is a requirement, we would speak to the projects on a case-by-case -case basis. I very much doubt that's going to be the case. The way that we've framed the business plan requirements is that uh, it covers all the questions that any uh, economic appraisal would have to undertake. Yes, Paul. Um, all projects will be issued letters of offer in euro. Yes, that's correct. So obviously that then um, means that the, the project, the, the lead partner, the, the partners are subject to the currency fluctuation exposure there. Yes. Um, most lead partners will disseminate that down to partners. But again, in terms of this, um, you know, particularly the habitats and species, again, that's a risk that maybe these organisations aren't prepared to take because they have that um, risk that they will lose money in the course of the project. Is there nothing that can be done in order to try to, um, you know, keep that more stable for projects? It's up to the project to present how they would propose to mitigate that risk. We obviously can't pay for exchange rate fluctuations, but if a project presented a case on a, a year by year basis and where they thought the projection was going to be and wanted to be funded on that basis, we would consider that. But there's no means for re reimbursement of exchange rate losses. The, the risk is entirely with the project. But what I would say is when you're presenting your pros proposals is to think about how you present that in a way that mitigates some of that risk. I suppose that's the question. The projects generally don't know how they could mitigate against I mean, can they use a, a certain rate or? Yeah. Well, there is the commission standard rates, which are published on a monthly basis. And there's a commission forecast rate as well, which is available from the European Commission's website it would be up to the projects to then take that rate and apply it to their projects going forward, um, but it then leaves them with the risk. It would be up to the project or any proposer to take financial advice on how they want to, to mitigate that risk, uh, whether they want to buy in currency for a period or, or, or talk to their banks and lenders about how they uh, fund this activity with a degree of risk. But what I would say is this is common across the rest of the UK where the issue uh, a lot of projects in euros and, and projects have to manage this risk. So there are mechanisms out there and there are experiences out there. I suppose again, just to comment on this, you've got NGOs that just don't have that capacity mm -hmm. to uh, you know, borrow a lot from banks or whatever, so it's a difficult one for them. Yeah, no, I, I, I sympathize with the position. Um,
saying that there's decisions there for the project um, in terms of how you establish contracts under the project. So if you're buying in services or if you're buying, you know, if you're establishing um, staffing um, contracts, do you do that in euros and limit your exposure to any fluctuation or is that something that's a necessity to do in sterling? So there are decisions there for the projects in terms of how they establish that going forward as well to try and minimise down the level of exposure under the particular project um, concept and, and project idea. But as Paul says, we're not in a position to be able to reimburse um, the exchange rate loss. Um, but again, it's one of those things in terms of quantifying the degree of exposure that a project may be facing in terms of the value of that project. And it may be something in terms of if you are establishing a small contingency fund to deal with unexpected expenses, it may be something that you would factor into that in terms of the delivery out of the project. Maria Ferguson from Donegal County Council. Um, just given the nature of the call, we would anticipate that maybe at stage one, that some of the projects that come in, there may be some potential overlap between them. Um, but also, hopefully, there may be some potential synergies that you could create between different bids that are coming forward. And I just wonder, have you any thoughts at this stage as to how you might deal with that from stage one to stage two? Certainly. Um Obviously, it's a competitive process that we are holding. It's a competition to deliver the outputs as detailed in the cooperation program. So within that, though, there will be a degree of competing factors which we will then determine which one has the, 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 the greater likelihood of success if it progresses to stage two. We would then feed back that to the stage one applicants uh, that were unsuccessful. And the, the ones that were successful, we would ask them to then reflect on what's gone before if we thought appropriate and maybe talk to other partners that were unsuccessful. Um, the 15% uh, uh, of employment costs that can be added for overheads mm -hmm. uh, doesn't um, reflect the cost of overheads by and large. Uh, most of our organizations, and I know the, the BTO that I represent, um, would have overhead rates of 100% uh, or, or ours is slightly over. Uh, and those, um, I mean, that's well documented within our organization what our overhead rates would mm -hmm. be. So 15% doesn't represent the actual cost of overheads. Yeah. Does the difference, uh, can the difference be considered as co-financing? Because we will have to cost uh, the full overheads for anybody uh, that's involved in this project? Uh, yes, it can. Um, that would be classed as an in-kind contribution of overheads, for instance. But if we are paying a proportion, we would need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. But there is a principle there where if you're uh, lending X amount, providing it could be evidenced, then it would be an in-kind contribution. Would that be along your lines of thinking, Helen? Yeah, that would be okay, um, but there is rules around eligibility, so you would only be able to include what is an eligible project cost. So what your organisation sees as an overhead, we might not classify that as an overhead, so it would still have to fit in with our overhead rules, which is heat and light and um, you know some management time and that kind of thing. It might not necessarily be what you would state as an overhead for your organisation. So we would have to look at that and we would have to probably look at the actual costs that are incurred within your overheads for us to be able to say that that was eligible or not. The, the point I would make is that you, what you consider to be a staff cost might also be a, 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 an external uh, cost. So it won't actually be a staff cost. So you need to look at our uh, application guide. There's the application guide and then there's the rules for the program which is available on our website, quite considerable documents, and they detail in much more uh, expressed terms exactly what constitutes a staffing cost and exactly what constitutes an overhead. And you'll find that if you do not fall within that category, you will likely fall within one of the other six categories which we have. Okay, uh, any other questions? 
just wrap up there. Um, what we would ask that in advance of uh, coming back after lunch is that you have a think around the three theme, theme areas which we're proposing to offer you time to discuss this afternoon, and that's finance, uh, project partnership, and uh, the cross border nature and deliverability, and then results and outputs. Uh, I would also ask that you leave your details on the, the flip charts for others to, to view and, and potentially form some collaboration around. Uh, we will share the flip charts wider for the people that aren't here today and can't be with us, so they will be available on our website for others to make contact with you should you wish to do so. Um, if that's all, I think I'll leave now.